We're going to be getting into chapter one of the night textbook and uh, you, what you want to do is make sure that you have completed the assigned reading that goes along with this presentation. And so what we're going to do is uh, we're going to start off with a study of how things move and while we're measuring how things move we have to have some tools in our toolbox for that. So uh, let's get to it. Let's see what we'll be using. So um, this particular photograph uh, you can see that it's a time lapse and it was probably at a really high shutter speed setting. So continue on and so what we're looking at is uh, we're using a dot to represent the position wherever whatever you're looking at be it a frog a ski or a car somebody rollerblading and what we do with those dots those dots as you see on this particular screen represent equal time intervals and you're like well how could that be because I'm looking at these dots and they're not equally spaced well they're not equally spaced because whatever this object is well in this case it's a car it isn't moving um, at uh, the same speed so there the dots will be um, separated by different distance and distances but de uh, depending on whether the car is speeding up or slowing down and in this case the car is slowing down because in each successive second you'll notice the space between the dots gets smaller and smaller the car is slowing down um, at every second and it appears that actually it's moving at the same speed up till four seconds and then it begins to break so we use dots to represent um, the car or the frog it's easier than drawing a, a car or a frog or a skier and we say up oh, the dot just represents the object it just makes it uh, easier to uh, calculate so with that in mind um, we're also going to be having to look at um, what type of SI units or labels that we use on numbers in physics because uh, physics it's it, there's a lot of math involved with it but the interesting thing is that uh, usually to just put the number three down as an answer won't get it in a physics class it usually has to have some type of SI unit on it for example three what three seconds or let's say how far you went it would be three meters or let's say you were finding out temperature for something and it's not just three it's three degrees Kelvin so most of the time we're we're having to put uh, an SI unit on our numbers so and as the year goes on you'll get more familiar with those units and I'll always say don't leave those numbers naked they need a unit on it and so that's where I usually bring in that saying so we'll also be looking at ratios so not only three meters maybe it's three meters per second so we'll start getting um, a look at ratios and sometimes in your calculus class you'll call it a derivative and um, anyways uh, we won't be using that language in, in physics but you'll hear different um, descriptions for the for the same things we might be doing in the in a physics course that, that you might hear in a calculus course or another math course All right, so vectors uh, vectors now so the interesting thing is we have some um, numbers uh, when units like three meters the dog ran three meters east oh and then the dog ran three meters south and so when we start giving directions along with our numbers and units we know that we have something that's called a vector and a vector has a quantity and a direction so it has two uh, two really key pieces to it and the nice thing with vectors is uh, it introduces a a, a way for us uh, with using vector analysis we can figure out a lot of things about quantities and with units that are vectors and we'll see how to uh, do that you'll have you've already had some practice with vectors in your math class and the interesting thing is you may find the methods that I use in my course a little different 
uh, compared to the ones you used in your math course. But if you get to the same answer, even if it's a different procedure or process, uh, there's many ways to find the answer and you most certainly do not have to use uh, the method I show you. You can use whatever uh, you've used, you know it's right, you're comfortable with it, and you get to what you the information you need. So let's continue. All right, so what we're looking at since uh, we're starting off our, our year with looking at motion, and a fancy way for looking at motion, and you don't care about why it's moving, like this motorcycle, it's moving because they have a throttle being turned by their hand, they, they have, um, there's a gas, there's combustion going on here. We don't care why the top is spinning around. Uh, we don't care how this basketball got into motion. Um, what we're doing is just saying, hey, something's moving. So let's measure some things about its motion. Uh, and that's it. We're not talking about why it's moving. We're just looking at it and saying, let's take some measurements on this moving object. So we'll look at straight line motion, circular motion, projectile motion. And projectile, you'll hear, um, projectiles are anything that are under the influence of free fall. So a basketball in the air, a tennis ball in the air. Uh, throwing up your uh, uh, your younger sister, younger brother in the swimming pool. Uh, anything that's in the air under the influence of gravity is uh, considered projectile motion. And then the rotational motion with this top. Let's continue. All right, so um, well, we're going to start making motion diagrams. And a motion diagram in this case, so you see a car and you're like, oh, I saw that we use dots to represent the car. We will. It's much easier to use a dot to represent the car. So this is going to be um, kind of like a time lapse picture that was taken. The top one is, is the first moment of time, and then the one underneath it, we could say, oh gosh, that's a second later. And then the third one is, oh, that's three seconds later. And then the fourth one, oh, that's four seconds later. And what we do is we take these time lapse pictures and then we put them together, as you would see in the picture on the right. And as time passes, what we do is represent that as a dot and we start tagging it with time, like the one the car on the left would be t equals zero, and the next one would be t equals one second, and then the third one t equals two seconds, and then the last one t equals four seconds. And labeling diagrams in this fashion is very helpful for um, when you start trying to figure out problems and as they get more complex. All right, so here are some different motion diagrams. Uh, the first one just shows the ball sitting there. So uh, if it's stationary, that it's just sitting there, there won't be dots moving to the left or to the right. It doesn't matter whether the object's moving to the, the left or the right. Um, in this case, it looks like everything is moving to the right, well, except for the ball up top, which is stationary. Uh, the skateboarder, if we put dots at every spot where he is over the time lapse, uh, that's a constant speed, the young man. Now the young lady who's running, we put dots for her, every successive second, she's covering more ground. So this young lady's speeding up. And then uh, below her, we have a car where every successive frame, the car gets closer and closer over time. This is indicating that the car is, is slowing down. And then last but not least, we have uh, parabolic motion and the basketball here, it's in free fall. And you're, you're smart students and you're thinkers. And in your head, you're looking at this basketball and you're thinking to yourself, well, I know it has, uh, it's moving horizontally towards the basket, but I also know that there's some vertical motion going on here too. It's going up and it's coming back down. So that's why they say it's a more complex motion diagram because unlike the, the four before, which are just uh, one dimension, we have two dimensional motion. So, and as you'll see, all the, the, the four above, uh, we look, they're all in the X dimension. And then the parabolic motion has both an X and Y going on there. So we use a particle motion, and it simplifies the, uh, the diagrams, the pictures, and I mentioned this before. And so you'll notice that everywhere the car is, there's a dot, and then we'll just pretend like that's zero, time zero, there it is. Second one, time one, so you put the dot exactly where the car is located, time two, single dot, and you usually pick the middle of the object. We don't really get into center of mass at this point and uh, no pun intended right points we don't get into um, center of mass at, at this time and in this case if you 
We see these dots represent equal increments of time, but they most certainly don't represent equal increments of distance covered. This car is slowing down. All right, so the position and time, this is very important here. Uh, we use coordinate systems in class, and the one that you're most familiar with is the one we use most of the time, the Cartesian coordinate system, your X and Y coordinate system. And we define X, the positive X direction to the right, horizontally. We define the negative X to the left, horizontally. We define the positive Y heading up sh vertically, and the negative Y heading down vertically. Uh, there may be a time later uh, in the course where we introduce a third dimension, the Z dimension, and uh, if we, uh, I'll get to that uh, when we get to that point in the course. But we'll be doing using the coordinate system, our X, Y, uh, for most of the uh, applications and most of the, the, the concepts that we're learning.